Will the U.S. Supreme Court overturn Roe versus Wade? Stay tuned to find out. You're listening to Activist Radio, The Mark Harrington Show, and you can support the program by donating to Created Equal by going to createdequal.org. Uh, well, today we've got some breaking news coming out of Texas, and that is that the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, at least for now, has refused to uh, take the appeal of the uh, Planned Parenthood and others to put a block or a stay on the heartbeat bill, which is... Uh, as of today, is being enforced in the state of Texas. So this is the first time uh, that a heartbeat bill has actually been put into law, and that's big news uh, because we've been involved in that here in Ohio. We were involved uh, starting in 2011. It was the first heartbeat bill to be introduced in a state legislature, and it was introduced here in 2011. And then in 2019, uh, it finally passed our legislature and was signed into law. But since then, there have been uh, over a dozen heartbeat bills uh, that have passed legislatures across America. Uh, all of them have been held up in the courts except for this one in Texas. And so this is really breaking news. This is huge because this is the first time a heartbeat bill has actually been put into law. And therefore, um, you know, this is something we want to talk about today. But we also want to talk about the case that is going to be before the U.S. Supreme Court. And that is the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case, which the U.S. Supreme Court will likely hear either later this year or early in 2022. And in order to do that, I have as my guest today, Professor Robert George, and he is the professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Thank you for being on the program, Dr. George. It's my pleasure, Mark. Thanks for inviting me onto the show. Yeah, well, so what uh, what it kind of attracted me to having you on, uh, and I know we're a little ahead of things here with this case before the U.S. Supreme Court, was your uh, piece that you wrote in First Things, uh, giving your kind of take on the case and how it should be argued. But before we go to that, I want to get your impression or your thoughts on this breaking news coming out of Texas. Uh, Texas has become the first state to ban abortion after a detectable heartbeat. Uh, we all know these now, they're called heartbeat bills. And as I said before, we passed one in the state of Ohio. Uh, what makes this law different, I guess, would be the first question to you, uh, than the others, if there is a difference. And why is it that it's going, it, it is being uh, enforced today in the state of Texas? Well, this particular law is a bit different from some other laws in that it is not a criminal prohibition, but rather creates uh, private causes of action, rights of action uh, in litigation uh, against abortionists who take the lives of unborn children after uh, a heartbeat and the child has been uh, detected. But I think what has most fundamentally changed, if I can be very honest with you, Mark, is, is not that this bill is so much different from other heartbeat bills. It's that there have been significant personnel changes on the Supreme Court of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it now appears that um, there is majority. We can't say for sure, we won't know for sure until we get actual rulings, but it right. appears that there may be a majority for reversing Roe versus Wade. Uh, for so is there, is, to back up a little bit, so there is there are no criminal sa sanctions in this law. Is that what makes it different, if anything? Yeah, that, my understanding is that what this does is okay. create private rights of, uh, of of action. So litigation okay. in civil law can be brought against uh, those who kill unborn babies after a heartbeat has been detected. Which is new. I mean, that's something that has not been put in heartbeat bills uh, prior. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I, don't, that... I don't know all the bills, but... Uh, okay. but uh, a lot of uh, legislation and proposed legislation uh, has to do with the imposition of criminal uh, penalties uh, right. uh, on abortionists, uh, something I think is entirely uh, legitimate. It was our law for most of our history until Roe versus Wade um, uh, uprooted it. Uh, but this is different in that it, uh, uh, it creates civil rights of action, causes of action, rather than criminal prohibitions or criminal penalties. 
Uh, these are similar to the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn ordinances. That's that right. And right now, I think up to 30 some, 36 of these have passed in cities across America. We had one pass here in Ohio in the city of Lebanon, and we're hoping to have more of those come online here in the future. Uh, so this is very helpful. If, um, if you'll permit me to interrupt you just sure. for a second. I should add that like the traditional uh, laws uh, that were overturned in Roe versus Wade, uh, this law, the, the Texas law, imposes no liability of any sort to criminal or civil on women who seek abortions. It's rather on abortionists who actually do the carrying out of the deed of killing the unborn child. All right. So, folks, let's uh, let's keep following this. Uh, your radio activists here will be uh, reporting on this uh, as we find out more. But as of today, the Texas law is being enforced for state in the union to ban abortion after a detec detectable heartbeat. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I mean, since 2011, when we first introduced it in Ohio. Uh, and now we have uh, actually being enforced. So that's good news. Uh, so, Professor George, I'd like to move on. I want to talk about this piece that you wrote in First Things. Uh, when the U.S. Supreme Court decided to hear the case, you know, there was a lot of uh, activity, a lot of people talking about this as the uh, leading up to a, the possibility of overturning Roe versus Wade. And so what I'd like to do, and I know it's still possibly, you know, could be heard in the fall, might be heard more than likely it's going to be heard in the spring, and a decision won't be probably until June. But still, I think we need to kind of work through this. And I, I, I like the fact that, that your piece, you know, it's not just hopeful, but I think based on the, uh, the merits that, uh, you know, there's a good shot at uh, the U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. So what I'd like to do is just ask you a few questions. Um, why is Dobbs, the case before the U.S. Supreme Court, the most consequential, and this is what you call it, the most consequential litigation decision in the last 50 years uh, for the U.S. Supreme Court. Why is it such a big deal? It's uh, because of the controversial and problematic nature of Roe versus Wade, the 1973 decision uh, throwing out, uh, prohibiting all legal protection for innocent unborn human life. Um, something that has been reaffirmed by uh, the Supreme Court several times since uh, 1973. The trouble with that decision was not only uh, that it was unjust to the victims of abortion, the children who were killed in the act, but uh, also uh, it lacked any warrant in the text or logic or structure or original or historical understanding of the Constitution. It seemed to be, and indeed was, a pure judicial fabrication, mm -hmm. uh, a usurpation by the judiciary, and by the Supreme Court in particular, of the authority vested by the Constitution in the elected representatives of the people in the state legislatures, and perhaps uh, depending on uh, how you read the 14th Amendment uh, in, the, in the Congress. Up until now, there has not been a majority on the Supreme Court uh, to overturn Roe. Some of us uh, thought that that might happen in the early 1990s when um, we had some new um, uh, people on the court. It didn't happen. In fact, Roe versus Wade and its fundamental holding was reaffirmed in the early 1990s in a case called Planned Parenthood against Casey. But now there are significant uh, changes. And uh, I predict in that First Things article that you kindly mentioned that the court will in fact overturn Roe versus Wade. I should, I should add, Mark, that when the court took the Mississippi case, which is a law prohibiting uh, abortion after 15 weeks gestation, the conventional wisdom pretty much across the board, conservatives as well as progressives, pro-life people as well as people on the other side, the conventional wisdom was that the court would find a way to uphold as uh, constitutionally permissible the Mississippi statute, but without overturning Roe against Wade. I have been persuaded uh, in significant part by the work of my uh, student, Sharif Girgis, who's now a professor himself at Notre Dame Law School, that there is no logically coherent way to uh, do that. And I think the justices will understand that. Uh, and, and I'd like to get into why you believe that as well. So it'll be overturned. What, what does, so, so my question then is what makes this, uh, this case, this Mississippi, Mississippi case different 
than all the other cases that have gone up to the U.S. Supreme Court and the justices have not deemed it uh, enough, I guess, to overturn Roe v. Wade. I was in front of the court uh, during the Hellerstadt decision, which I think was two or three years ago, and there was hopes then that uh, the court might review Roe and overturn it, uh, but they didn't. And they haven't uh, until possibly with this case. So what is the difference? Is it because it's a direct ban on abortion at 15 weeks? Uh, is that what I think? Uh, and, and maybe that the uh, AG in Mississippi is going to be asking them to do that uh, because the U.S. Supreme Court could review Roe based on any abortion case, right or not? Yes, it could. That's right. Technically, uh, that is correct. I think the key, again, is personnel changes, and okay. most especially the addition to the court of Justice Amy uh, Coney Barrett, okay. uh, who would appear to be a person uh, who uh, would uh, be critical of Roe versus Wade. She has in her previous life as a professor been critical of Roe versus Wade, uh, not only uh, for pro-life reasons, but also because it seems to be such a direct defense against uh, constitutional principles themselves. There's not a warrant for it, as I say, in the text or logic or structure or historical understanding of the Constitution. So that would, again, it appears, and, and, and we can't be certain, but it again appears that you've got five and perhaps six votes then to uh, overturn Roe. Remember, uh, and your audience needs to remember, that Roe formally held that abortion had to be permitted as a constitutional right Mm -hmm. with some right. sort of invisible ink, I suppose, a constitutional right up to the point of fetal viability, which at the time Roe was handed down was considered to be roughly at 24 weeks gestation. Uh, now, because of technological developments, it can be as early as 22 weeks. But even with our current technology, it's not as early as 15 weeks. So a ban on 15 weeks, a ban on abortions after 15 weeks gestation, means that you've got legislation that is flying directly in the face of Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. So right. there is no way that you can uphold Roe versus Wade and still count the statute as constitutionally legitimate. So that's what makes the it different. Yeah. Uh, it yes, the court has signaled that it considers the statute constitutionally legitimate. So the question is, how is it going to uphold it? And can there be a way, or can a way be found to uphold it without overturning Roe? Uh, Sharif Girgis and others have convinced me that uh, there can't. In your article, First Things, uh, Dr. George, you, you talk about the uh, Attorney General of Mississippi and, um, and how they need to, she needs to, present that before the U.S. Supreme Court. When you wrote the article, the brief had not been published and made public, and you were you know, basically concerned as to how or what, what direction she was going to be taking. Uh, now the brief has been published, as far as I know. I read read some of it yesterday. Uh, are you uh, satisfied in uh, the approach that they're taking? Do you believe that uh, she is asking the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade? No question. Because that's what you say in your first in your first things article. Yeah, you you make it clear that that the attorney general has to make the case to overturn Roe v. Wade, or the court's just not going to do it. I mean, that's kind of your your case, right? Uh, the article, the whole point of the article was to urge Attorney General uh, Bitch uh, to uh, ask the court to overturn Roe versus Wade, rather than arguing that the court could uphold the the legislation without overturning Roe versus right. Wade. This is exactly what she and uh, the Solicitor General of the uh, state, uh, Scott Stewart, who again happens to be another of my former students, did. So they have asked the Supreme Court to overturn Roe. Uh, uh, Scott Stewart, the uh, Solicitor General, will be making the oral argument before the court, and he will, again, as he did in the brief, make that request uh, to the court. My guest today is Professor Robert George, and he is a professor of jurisprudence and a director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. And you can find out more by going to robertpgeorge.com. That's robertpgeorge.com. It's all lowercase to find out more about his work and some of his writings. Uh, he's an author of uh, more than a dozen books and was honored with the Presidential Citizens Medal by George W. Bush, President Bush. And so we're pleased to have Dr. George on the program today. Also, folks, we want you to take action here. I want to make sure that uh, you... 
take the opportunity to share the program on your social media. That means on Facebook and YouTube, please. If you would, let other people know about it. You can find us at uh, markcarringtonshow.com. And you can also find us on all the popular podcasting platforms. Uh, so if you would, just pass this along and ask your friends and colleagues to, to listen and watch the program. So, Dr. George, let's uh, let's get in a little deeper here with the Dobbs case. Um, so you were you were satisfied with the brief from A.G. Uh, Fitch, and you believe that the case is going to be made to overturn Roe versus Wade. Now, I want people to understand what that means if it does happen. I think there's a misunderstanding out there that people believe that if Roe is overturned, that abortion is made illegal across America. Uh, I, I believe that the U.S. Supreme Court is not going to reverse Roe in the sense of creating or at least um, the, the, the idea of the 14th Amendment, including personhood for the unborn. I, it's a highly unlikely that they're going to go to that far uh, uh, of a measure. They would li literally just return this back to the states. If that happens, uh, what takes place then? Politics and legislation. Okay. If it's returned to the states, then state by state, Ohio, Mississippi, New York, California, Colorado, Montana, West Virginia, Florida, the state's uh, elected representatives uh, in their state legislatures will have to decide what the law will be, how much, if any, protection uh, will be given to the uh, child in the womb. Uh, now, that is assuming, as I think you're right to assume, that the court does not take the step that I have, in fact, in my own amicus curiae brief, together with uh, Professor John Finnis of Oxford University, urged the court to take, oh, which right. would be the step of holding that unborn children, like all other members of the human family, are persons and, who are, and therefore protected by the um, equal protection and due process clauses of the 14th Amendment. If they were to go that far, and I agree with you that they probably won't, but if they were to go that far, then there would be a certain minimum protection uh, in place in virtue of the constitutional requirements, uh, leaving uh, some room, uh, some significant room for variability among the states as far as the regulation of abortion is concerned. But there would be a minimum of protection that would be required, basically elective abortions, that is abortions that are not required for uh, protection of the uh, health and uh, life and well-being of the mother could not be uh, uh, permitted, but that's as you say unlikely to happen. Why? Why did you? Why do you believe that the uh, that the court could do or should do that? Um, uh, you uh, think it's general. inherent in the in the uh, in history and jurisprudence that the the personhood clause in the Fourteenth Amendment includes the unborn, and yeah. it doesn't need a constitutional amendment. Is that the yeah. case you're making? Uh, that's exactly the case we're making. We looked at uh, the historical materials. Uh, at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment, it became very clear to us that those who ratified the 14th Amendment understood unborn children to be uh, persons. That means whether or not they had the unborn particularly in mind, uh, that they would be protected under the amendment in the same sense that, uh, that uh, people of uh, Croatian extraction might not have been <laughs> in the mind of the framers, but the general principle of the protection of the laws applying to all persons would include uh, Croatians. The, the key historical development actually was in science. It was the discovery of the mammalian ovum by von Baer in the 1820s, which made possible something new, and that is modern human embryology, our understanding of the gapless development of the human being from the earliest embryonic stage uh, uh, into uh, 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 adulthood ultimately uh, with his identity and unity and determinateness fully intact and by the time of ratification in the late 1860s when it comes to the 14th amendment the knowledge of human embryology that began with Bayer's great discovery uh, was fairly widespread at least among decently uh, educated uh, people they knew that what they had was a developing human being a human being in the earliest stages of development and not some non-human thing that somehow got transmogrified into being a human being. Well, it's interesting that you make that case because um, there's others that believe that as well. I, I've taken the position, you know, obviously I would welcome uh, a decision of that type from the U.S. Supreme Court. 
But because they're a strict constructionist, so to speak, they tend not to want to read into the U.S. Constitution uh, some political remedies. So they can they can kind of fall back to that and say, well, you know, we're not going to create the right to life for the unborn, just as we don't want to be creating the right to abortion. Uh, so that they, they tend to Scalia's. not want to go the. I'm sorry. That was Justice Scalia's position. So Justice right. Scalia took the position, someone I greatly respect. Uh, took the position that the Constitution is simply silent on the question of abortion and none of its principles have any implications for what the law should be. But I'm not asking the Supreme Court to invent a right. I'm not asking right. them to do for the pro-life cause what they did for the abortion cause in Roe versus Wade. Right. My argument is that the original public meaning of the term person gotcha. in the 14th Amendment at the time included all living members of the species Homo sapiens and that the unborn were understood correctly uh, in view of the developments in science to be living members of the human family. The species well, we family. can hope and pray that the U.S. Supreme Court does do that. What are your thoughts if they were to do that? Um, you know, that leaves the, the abortion decision still within the, you know, the realm of the U.S. Supreme Court rather than putting it as a human life amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And then, it, then it, you know, over time, we could see a change on the U.S. Supreme Court to the left, and they could do another Roe v. Wade type of thing. I still don't believe a human life amendment to the U.S. Constitution is necessary to settle it all for, uh, for once and for all. Well, that would be a great thing. It would be good to have it settled once and for all. The folks on the other side of this issue, those who strongly believe uh, in abortion and think that it's uh, some sort of right, are going to do everything they can to get a Supreme Court into place as soon as they can that will put Roe versus Wade back into place or something very much uh, like it. So there's there's nothing that we can do uh, other than, than oppose them every step of the way right. uh, to make it impossible for them to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize again that if what I think should happen happened, I don't think it will happen, but if it did happen, and if the 14th Amendment were interpreted correctly uh, to include in the category of persons, uh, children in the womb, it would not necessarily mean the court controls the agenda. Uh, Congress is empowered under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to enforce by appropriate legislation the guarantees set forth in Section 1, including the due process and equal protection guarantees. So the primary responsibility for protecting children would not be in the court, it would be in the Congress. But Congress itself would only be authorized to act if states failed to meet their minimum requirements. And the minimum requirement would be protecting children against elective abortion. There could still, I once again emphasize, be significant variability when it came to the question of so-called therapeutic abortion, which seems to be what people are primarily concerned about that is where abortion is regarded as medically indicated uh, to prevent severe uh, harm to the or death to the mother. My guest today is Robert George, and you can find out more about his work by going to robertpgeorge.com. And you're listening to Radio Activist here on the Mark Harrington Show. And folks, you can donate to our mission here, uh, the radio program, as well as our outreach on college and high school campuses by going to createdequal.org slash donate. Um, this program's coming to you by the faithful donations of our uh, supporters. Uh, so Dr. George, we got about a minute left. I I'd like to just ask you to wrap it up. I know we don't want to stargaze too much. I know we don't want to pronosticate or, uh, too much on this, but uh, you know, a lot of people are looking at this case and thinking that this is the best shot we've ever had uh, since Roe v. Wade was handed down. You obviously are very hopeful that will take place. If you could summarize why you're hopeful that uh, Roe v. Wade will be overturned in the Dobbs case. Two reasons, uh, and they're both uh, necessary conditions of it happening. Uh, one is you've got a piece of legislation coming up out of Mississippi, which is plainly and undeniably in conflict with the central holding of Roe versus Wade. It prohibits okay. pre viability abortions. Secondly, you now have personnel changes on the court that make it at least appear to be the case that you've got 
a majority, maybe even a 6-3 uh, majority, uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade, not or not primarily on uh, pro-life grounds, but rather on the ground that Roe versus Wade violates the Constitution by failing to uh, find any sort of anchor in the text or logic or structure or historical understanding of the Constitution. All right. Well, we appreciate you being on the program today. Again, my guest is a Robert P. George professor at Princeton University, and you can find out more by going to robertpgeorge.com. You've been listening to your radio activist on the Mark Harrington Show. God bless you. God bless America. And remember America to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to make a difference for the cause of life, liberty, and justice, go to createdequal.org. To follow Mark, go to markharringtonshow.com. Be sure to tune in next time for your marching orders in the culture war.